Hello. So we're going to go into chapter 64, the abstruseness of the pattern. This is the last chapter of section part four. I don't want to leave it out, this section out, so I'm going to keep on going. Um, brief references have been made to the viewpoint of workers who interpret the psychopaths dynamically and who offer much evidence of etiologic influences in emotional conflict. As already mentioned, Healy long ago pointed out that antisocial behavior often seemed to occur as a response to unhappy life situations. And Alexander has formulated such disorders in psychopathic analytic terms as a propulsive acting out of unconscious pathologic situations. Such an acting out in vivid and very lightly disguised symbiotic, symbolic deeds might be illustrated in the case reported here in which the man responds to what is often spoken of as being in a doghouse by putting on his dog's collar and spectacularly caricaturing canine behavior. Canine behavior. <laughs> Another response to the same situation can be found in a patient who literally got into a kennel at the veterinarians and so exhibited himself. Knight's work with severe chronic alcoholics reveals significant points. We cannot presume that all of his ca cases are of the type described here, but those referenced to as essential alcoholics apparently belong to our group. Knight indeed says of these, and quote, they are called psychopaths that are not even accepted by some therapists. All right, this is a really important chapter, guys. You know, really pay attention to this. I'm going to try to read slow, okay? Careful study of these patients include psychoanalysis of some indicated, in quotations, a parental background characterized by inconsistency and lacking of unanimity, unanimity or parental discipline resulting in conflicting, unstable indications in the sun, end quote. A weak, pampering mother in combination with a domineering father whose severity has fitful and inconsistent appeared frequently in the backgrounds of Knight's cases. He feels that important casual relationships between these early situations and the subsequent disorders are likely. Knight says, in quote, innumerable personality shadings and accents are possible from a son's reactions to such parental management. But one regular result seems to be the fostering of excessive passive demands and expectations in the son. Such passive, childish, feminine wishes being in marked conflict with masculine strivings inculcated by the father and by the cultural ideology absorbed from the schooling and from contacts with other males, <laughs> but they were emasculated too. Knight finds indications of oral fixations in the cases that are ordinarily called psychopaths, and he also brings out the point that with them, and he puts in quotes, Treatment seldom lasts long since, becoming dismayed at the long road they must travel, they quit on one pretext or another or talk with their relatives and believing that they are badly handled or they are now cured as a giving fellatio to the trans woman. <laughs> I'm cured. Nope. <laughs> I'm not even getting distracted this morning. Yeah. I hope you're thankful. I'm cured. <laughs> I 
Like you're serious, Cornelius. Excuse me. Let's put some oil on my hands. Soften me up. I need to get softened up right now. I hope everybody slept good this morning. I've been sleeping so good since March. Can you believe it? It's like a whole dark cloud has been lifted off of me. I still get attacked, but I don't have these anxieties like I used to have last month. It was really bad. All right. You ready, Cornelius? You ready? Because people watching you. You ain't got it all day. All right. The studies of green knackery also indicate that the confusing influences of a stern authoritarian father and an indulgent or frivolous mother is common in the early backgrounds of the psychopaths. It is plausible to feel that such an influence may play an important part in defective development of conscious and of ordinary social and personal evaluations. Karpman, and he's referring to other uh, psychoanalysis of psychiatrists in his field. So when I'm throwing out these names like Knight, Karpman, and he has another name here that I can't find right now, but these are these doctors. Uh, Lindner is another name he uses as well. Knight, Cartman, Lindner. Okay. Cartman, in his extensive work with the manifestations of character and behavioral disorders, reports that in most cases, a psychogenic etiology can be established if adequate investigation is made. A relatively small percentage of those we call psychopaths, he believes, are not be are not so motivated. These presumably disordered because of inborn or constitutional defects, he distinguishes from the majority and calls anthopaths. He calls them A N E T H O P A T H. S. Anthopaths. Of chief importance to the present discussion in the fact that in most of the patients whose clinical manifestations are similar to those described here, Cartman finds it possible to discover a background of what he refers to as a basic neurosis behind a psychopathic facade. In these studies, he appear, it appears that when Neuroses is contrasted with psychopath. It is for the purpose of indicating psychopathologic casual factors and purposes in the disorder rather than to make a clinical identification of patients showing grave and persistent antisocial and self-defeating activities with those showing the ordinary manifestations of, of a psychoneurosis. It is of particular interest to note that Cartman says, in quote, while it is true that the psychopath does not have the psychotic disorder's appreciations of reality, the psychotic's distorted appreciation of reality, his appreciation of reality is entirely pathologic, even though it is different from that of the psychotic. Okay, so how is this a different type of psychopathology? Uh, pathologic. So these are the two different domains of pathologies is what he's referring to from the psychotic? I don't know. Let's keep reading. Littner, Littner devotes almost an entire volume. He calls this volume Rebel Without a Cause to the detailed reports of one psychopath studied by hypoanalytic methods. A very concrete presentation is made through 
verbatim materials described by dictaphone. Traumatic experiences elicited from the patient dated as having occurred as early as age six or eight months is interpreted as being reached by proverbial memory process, distorted attitudes toward the parents, and a peculiarly adverse primal scene experiences seems in this interesting presentation to be primary influences in a lifelong pattern of severe behavioral disorders an impressive and closely knit scheme of interwoven cause and effects emerges in the detailed reports and indeed seems to account for the clinical picture in terms of pathologic motivation and purpose. Several other patients studied by not present or but not presented are reported to have shown similar traumatic experiences at an early age and similar reactions to these experiences. Satisfactory therapeutic results are reported in these cases. Sprague, this is another doctor, in discussing the narcissistic aspects of the psychopath, gives the impression of describing features more or less the same as many we have attempted to formulate as an expression of semantic malfunctioning. He says, in quote, what the psychopath does not does with proportions of reality is to have their meaningful, let me repeat this, what the psychopath does with portions of reality is to have their meaningfulness to himself as emotionally colored stimuli differ, differ from what it is to the average individual. So this meaningfulness of the psychopath to himself as emotionally colored stimuli. There's a pink, let's bring it to my heart. There's a yellow. We're talking about the stimuli in rainbow colors. They're just floating around. Can you imagine? <laughs> and they're meaningful to him. <laughs> Hence, the power of reality to move the psychopath, to arouse him, to teach him, to limit him. It's not what it is for the others. Unlike himself, Sprague, feels that the failure to care enough about many of the items and issues which have considerable meaning for the most of us is in the psychopath not due to much, so much to emotional incapacity as to his interest being centered elsewhere. He speaks of such patients as having not disinterest, but rather too intense in emotionalities. So they become hyperfixated on things. That's an artistic, right? Oh, let's keep reading. In the present material, the cases presented here and hundreds of similar patients studied, there are often indications of such a parental background as that described by Knight. Considerable evidence sometimes became available to suggest causative factors like those discussed by Cartman. One patient reported by the latter is interpreted as motivated by hostility and inferiority, which arose from early rejection. An analytic study revealed this to be a case of neuroses in which hostility has far outweighed love because of denial of the latter and material rejection. Criminality resulted in part from hostility for which it serves as an outlet and partly as an aggressive compensation for ego inferiority resulting from maternal rejections. Do y'all hear this? This is all hostilities in this man to why he feels this is ego inferiorities that he feels on the inside of him. Could this be pathologic in, in a sense or neuropathologic? I don't know. This brings me to a, a study that I did yesterday to kind of derail this topic. 
because I want y'all to see how environment does play also into neuropathologic, or we're going to talk about the chemical or uh, histiology that is the microscopic cellular level of, of the cell. That's the histiology. And then we're going to talk about also the, so it's the microscopic and the cellular levels of the neuropathology. Some would argue that there's no, I guess, indications or no demonstrations of this in our environment. But all you have to do is just go into this black community, go into the conditions of slavery, and you can see these linkages uh, of these neuropathologies being passed down and being influenced by the environment as well. So the, the environmental factors, uh, and then we're going to say that these oh, pathways that are being damaged, uh, these hormonal changes are being crippled in that individual uh, due to cortisol release and stress. So I did a study yesterday and I just want to read it to you guys so you can make the link that um, these neuropathologies play a role chemically and environmental in us. Stress changes the molecular structure of a cell. I'm, I'm going to prove it to you guys. Severe, so this is a study by an article that I found. It's an article journal called the Acta Neuropathologica. You can find it on Google. The Acta Neuropathologica. It's a study called Neuropathologies of Stress that was done in 2013. Severe or prolonged stress is well known to increase the risk to develop psychopathologies such as PTSD, depression, schizophrenia, or anxiety disorders and may trigger psychotic episodes. Stress. Can you think of stress being in our environment? Yes. Prolonged of this can trigger all of these psychopathologies. So when I talk about the neuropsychopathologies that we adopted out of slavery, it was PTSD, depression, schizophrenia, and anxieties, people. This is what kept, kept being passed down through epigenetics to us. These are the psychopathologies. And prolonged stress will increase the risk of psychopathologies. I'm telling you this. This is reflected by the hypertrophy. Hypertrophy means an increased volume of an organ of the adrenal and pituitaries. Adrenal is the, a gland that makes the steroid hormones like our adrenaline that helps control heart rate, blood pressure. And the pituitary is a small gland located at the base of the brain and its function is for the producing of hormones that help our growth, metabolisms, uh, response to our stress and our trauma and reproduction. So these are very important glands, uh, the pituitary and the, um, and the adrenal glands. There's a hypertrophy or an increased volume of these organs when, when in contact with stress hormones like cortisol. Effective and stress-related brain disorders are explained by neurochemical imbalances. So stress will create this neurochemical imbalance. This is stress-related and it will create stress-related brain disorders in us, right? Impairments in structural plasticity and volumetric changes of specific limbic areas also contribute to their pathophysiology. However, it is still unclear whether it should be classified as truly pathological or whether they may re represent plastic adaptations to a stressor that can to some extent be reversible. So that's the maneuver, but then this just gets keeps, I guess, that I guess the integrity of that now 
change sale never changes. It never has the time to reverse due to the prolonging of, of that stimuli in that person's environment. Exposure to chronic or severe stress has profound effects on the structure and functional integrities of limbic brain area that not only coordinates the stress response, but are also exposed to the altered expression levels of different hormones, neurotransmitters, and trophic factors. Morphological, morphological means like the form of the structure. So morphological changes are detectable both at the cellular levels affecting specific brain areas So they've discovered that there are structural changes in cellular levels that affect specific brain areas. And if we know that these specific brain areas is what's triggering our psychopathologies, how we have time to reverse this by getting away from the negative stimulus? We don't have time. So it's more than likely hypertrophy is what's creating these morphological changes in cellular levels. That's the hypertrophy of the pituitary and adrenal gland, gland, glands. Wow. It is still very difficult to pinpoint when adaptive adaptative changes turn into maladaptive or pathological and when symptoms start to deteriorate. Notably, many stress-induced morphological changes are specific to selected brain areas and even to specific cell types where they often correlate well with the functional disturbances of that given brain structure. Wow, so it becomes adaptative to be maladaptive. That is um, natural selection playing biophysical, uh, phys uh, biophysiologically in our in our bodies, right there. In humans, severe or repeated stress often contributes to the development, or can be worsen the outcome of a psychopathology. And I did this study simply by uh, a section in part four, uh, where I was talking about neuropathologic. Uh, disorders. Uh, he says in this book, in Clicky, he says, no neuropathologic or neural changes, chemical or histologic. Histologic means the study of microscopic anatomies of tissues, has been demonstrated as evidence of a defect of an assumed inborn organic defect. That leaves people constitutionally inferior or moral imbeciles. This is important for me to realize that this statement was being made uh, according to Black people. This wasn't referring to Blacks, only to white people because they tried to base our inferiorities based on our biologies. Call us moral imbeciles and in constitutionally inferior and they justified our treatment based on this notion. Was this not neuropathologic in nature to be treated like this on slave farms? How could they not find chemical or histologic uh, data or studies on the changes in the environment, how these environmental and pathologic changes was being passed on through their offsprings and, and predicting their behaviors. So it definitely did affect, have long-term effects on, on neuropathologic, these neuropathological disorders did affect us is what I'm trying to say. Because he also says that the factors of environment definitely does play also into these 
disorders as well. So anyways, we know that this is true. And I'm just giving y'all some proof and some data about how stress changes the molecular structures and the integrities of these cells. And let me get back to this book. Many of the, so the last thing I said was the criminality resulted in part by hostilities for which it served as an outlet. So these men are feeling, these patients are reported by the latter is interpreted as motivated by hostilities and inferiority, which arose from early rejections. Can we prove that stress in the natal environment and in the outside objective environments created neural pathologies of depression and, and anxieties, inferiorities in that person? Though they cannot have, they don't have studies of finding it from a, or to these neural pathologies being affected from a chemical or histiologic level. It didn't change the behavior of that person and the inferiority of that person, which dictates his decisions, right? And that's going to be generated by his hostilities of feeling inferior. Early rejoice the figure experienced it from his mother, but it triggered something within him, some DNA marker that was already in him, that's inborn in him, and it was triggered by his environment because it it sustained his hostilities. His hostilities never went away. So neuropathology is hostilities and is the symptoms of this is hostilities and inferiorities. An analytic study revealed that this is to be the case of neuroses in which hostility has far outweighed love because of denial of the latter and maternal rejections. Criminality resulted in part from hostilities from which it serves as an outlet. So it was almost guaranteed that these men who was feeling this already inborn sense of inferiority was gonna get hostile by that also neglectful and misattuned and, uh, and disengaged mother who also is experiencing uh, neurological, neuropathologies uh, of schizophrenia in, in, in herself where she doesn't attach and attune with the child. So more likely it's gonna be unloving, unnurturing and stressful environment for the child. Now the child's not gonna have a sense of, of, of real safety and, and love and nurturing in his environment. And he's gonna have a conflicting and confusing notion of love and hate, uh, trust and distrust and things of this nature. So. It's going to or it's definitely create hostilities as predicted by these psychologists. They created the simulated environments for us, for an outlet to take this hostility out on each other, right? And partly as an aggressive compensation, since he can't compete in his environment, right? For ego inferiority, since this never went away since slavery resulting from maternal rejection, which was almost guaranteed in this unit family uh, accident establishment that they created. Many of the parents we have been appear to be having similarly and in their backgrounds, it is often possible to get at least suggestions of what might off once have produced feelings of rejection. Yeah, let's figure out what it's what caused these women to be rejected. <laughs> Probably patriarchy. And male misogyny. So, too, some of our patients have reported experiences not unlike those described by Lindner, not infrequently, sometimes under hypnosis or drug narcosis, sometimes with consciousness. Not so altered incidences have emerged that seem to offer valid clues to a convincing explanation. Not a few patients told of witnessing the primal scene, some at ages scarcely about infancy, 
many signs of emotional reactivity often come accompanying their various revelations. Let us consider briefly two examples. One man, 35 years old, gave vivid details under repeated hypnotic investigations of being brutally snatched away from the mother's lactating breast by the father who replaced him who replaced him and nursed her forcibly, brusquely, but thoroughly. Meanwhile, immobilizing her despite her struggles, protests and screams, conscious and very overt incestuous impulses toward the mother during his early years, frank and bitter new murderous wishes toward the father was that's the edible conflict and spontaneously expressed and with vehemence. The patient denied and showed no evidence of familiarity with the Freudian concepts of edible conflicts, of course. Fellatio what? <laughs> Fallas who? That's not me, boss. I am puritanical. Much more material equally impressed was elicited, including particularly traumatic details about his reactions to sex relations between the parents, which he claimed to have witnessed during the first years of his life and which he described in specific detail. And that's how I figured out where babies came from. <laughs> A boy of 17 under M metal narcosis told of similarly significant experiences. Many details emerged suggesting profound bewilderment, hate, fear, maximum insecurities, subtly and grossly incestuous distortions that arose from experiencing reported as occurrences occurring at the age of three years. These centered about a partial and mystified sensing of major unhappiness in the mother who sometimes shrieked wept and appeared to be at the point of death because of something she complained of to the father, whom she called vile, merciless, a fraud, and a fend. No clear understandings arose from his repeated being taken alone by the father, apparently as a screen against the mother's suspicion <laughs> of the infidelity on adulterous ventures. <laughs> Oh, he took the child with them to throw off the scent, right? <laughs> in the back seat, son. He offered details of the scene in which left to play on the floor of an adjoining room. Hey, that happened to me as well. He overheard much that puzzled him. Like, he described very convincingly a grandfather clock in the face of rendezvous behind which he sometimes hid so that he could obtain a view of the copulating couple. The account he gave indicated, indicated that stress and confusion of the most dramatic nature affected him during this period. Some, but by no means all, of this material impressed me as probably representing fabrications or fantasy confused with memory rather than accurately recalled facts. It has often been noted that the psychopath will very convincingly report entirely false incidences and attitudes in others, particularly in parents that tend to be responsibility for his difficulties upon others. This is a factor deserving constant attention for it can enter very subtly into material obtained from parents of this sort. When significant objective events could be checked through others, sometimes confirmatory evidence was obtained, sometimes the opposite. The point most difficult to corroborate in my own experience is the actual or innermost personal reactions of these patients to the events they report. It is most difficult than with others to tell what the events means to them. It must be admitted that all strongly emotional and deeply personal inner experiences is specific to each human being and not accurately a com communicatable. The nearest approximation to su success 
in these fields probably occur in poetry, music, the private speech and action of lovers that literally are objectively unreal report of religious mystics or perhaps sometimes in silence, the turning of a head, the lights and eyes dearly cherished, a simple unintentional gesture. It is scarcely original to emphasize here that specific or any objectively referential language is objectively and notoriously ineffective and quite untrustworthy in this entire area. It must be granted then that no genuinely verifiable material can be obtained from any patient about his significant affective states, attitudes, or experiences. Nothing that we conclude about such matters can be proved for the benefit of others or even ourselves. This fact, nonetheless, not, notwithstanding, we are able to achieve varying degrees of convincing, convincing the convictions about what is going on in our fellow. Prolonged psychiatric contact with patients often give us valid reasons for believing rather confidently in many estimates we make of this sort. I often feel sufficiently convinced about material gathered from patients to find in their reactions a comprehensible and helpful explanations of what they do and why they do it. Similar convictions arises on reading or hearing the reports of others who present material in which subjective appraisal must be inevitably entered. And attempting to put together material, objective and subjective, obtained from the psychopath, it is not always insuperably difficult to fit items into the pattern that, according to personally and rather generally accepted concepts of psychopathology, offers a cogent explanation of his conduct. There is, however, almost inevitably, a serious deficit or inappropriateness in what can be gathered from his reaction. This deficit makes strong convictions that the patient has been adequately accounted for difficult indeed. Skepticism is furthermore increased by the fact that he does not show the change or improvements that and others often encourage us to feel that we have been, at least in a part, correct in our conclusions. In not a few of these cases, an impressive account could be given of incidents and reported at reactions with indications of emotions that seem on the basis of penis envy, paternal rejections, anal fixations, or or that or reality, et cetera, to explain emotional withdrawals despite maintenance of excellent rational contact from the areas or levels of living in with severe hurt, deep joy, pain, genuine pride and shame, dignity and love are encountered in experience, protest reactions, loss of insight, and acting out of unconscious impulses, a behavioral caricature or diatribe against life and its for the psychopath, subjective emptiness are strongly suggested by what we meet clinically. I feel that such interpretations may be correct, that sometimes they deserve the estimate of probability. The material elicited might also be used to support the hypothesis of a masculine protest to hurts, to, to hurts and subjective insecurities never inadequately not never adequately known or understood by the patient, a neurotic and immature travesty of dominance in which attention is gained, many petty impulses grant. Those are those and childhood anxieties right here. Subjective insecurities. It's like a masculine protest that he's dealing with to to these hurts and subjective insecurities that were never adequately known or understood by the him. So it's unconscious, but they created establishments in the society against this woman due to these childhood insecurities. This is a neurosis and an immature travesty of dominance in which 
attention is gained, many petty impulses gratified, and many grudges is against authority relieved. This pattern seems to be followed at the expense of all major human fulfillments, but these are not known personally and emotionally to the patient, but it's known to his wife. <laughs> yeah, she's doctoring her black eye. Are not particularly valued, and so do not tempt or allure him to modify his course having developed a special callousness or having failed to mature in those capacities that would make him response, respond to personal indignity or to the suffering of others. He lacks these ordinary, rather powerful guiding stimuli. In his efforts to take a viral road, he becomes as he's been said, not a wandering hero, but subjectively an itinerant hobo who pseudo adventures are little more than a buffoonish takeoff on human life. A great deal of material is often available to indicate such factors, reactions, and propulsive patterns. Mm -hmm. I have, however, found no regular way to get close enough to these patients to gain from them the sort of conviction that often arises in the therapy of other types that make one feel confident in his estimate of cause and effect. Clues from the dreams often suggest significant attitudes or impulses not directly discernible, and though many interesting surmises can be made on this basis, I seldom reach much in the reactivity of these patients to corroborate them adequately or to open up channels of investigation progressively helpful. It has been interesting to note that experiences ordinarily with him withheld or deeply repressed in other people sometimes are much more quickly and readily divulged by these patients. Though shame and terrible conflict are sometimes claimed to such matters and superficial indications of such claims may be impressive, I am unable to feel that I regularly get at any level with the patient in which such effects are major or even quite real. If the psychopathologic hypothesis that emerges from the study of a patient might be compared to the construction of a brick house, it would be it would be helpful to say with the psychopath, there are often plenty of bricks and often and one can set up the metaphorical structure in orthodox form, but there are no cement to fuse the element solidly into a substantial whole or only such poor cement that we lack confidence in the security of our building. Given the evidence reported in the life of such a patient, one can sometimes see how these might have displaced his aims, cumulatively distorted his conduct, astrified his potentialities for meaningful affect, and left him finally in a state of existence where, it, where its clinical picture becomes comprehensible. But with him, far more than with other patients, surmise must be dependent upon to feel in what, what cannot convincingly satisfy oneself about concerning his real response at some distant time or at the present. When one considers the many traumatic events that all people must encounter, it seems wise to keep in mind what surmise and what is more substantial evidence. Gotta go pee. I'll be back.
Though gross and over traumatic incidents have been mentioned, these did not appear so regularly as the possibility and the probability of subtle environmental and personal influences, which masked by flawlessly conventional surfaces are almost impossible to demonstrate convincingly. Frankly, frankly broken homes, overt parental spoiling, harshness discernible by neighbors or by a social worker 10 years later, plain models by deceit or for counter-reactions to hypercritical pseudo-moralities are sometimes evident in the background. More often, there are suggestions of parental relations in many react, re respects superb yet at some deep point where the child meets them crucially for him inadequate and puzzling. More prominent than gross difficulties in the surroundings are the indications of beautifully and mercifully veiled sorts of invisible rejections or pathologic stimulations of unspoken but powerfully communicated appeals that evoke efforts resulting in frustrations, <laughs> You're like social strivings. As already pointed out, I feel that considerable evidence indicates a casual relations between the abstruse, paradoxically compounded, and ambivalent nature of the factors suspected of psychogenic significance and the complex and deeply masked nature of the disorder such factors may shape. If such a relation exists, it may be some degree account for the special difficulties we have encountered in obtaining from the psychopath convincing subjective information about what has happened and about what how he was expected affected by it the, the good The good qualities, the health and socially valuable reactions of parents and others important environmental figures, the insight which enables them to avoid obvious mistakes, all tend to obscure from the psychiatric examiner such factors as we refer to, and it would seem logical to think might make them almost unimaginably difficult for the child to evaluate or react to in other than a very confused and dangerous pattern. My difficulty in demonstrating regularly a satisfactory psychopathologic explanation and adequate cause and effect relation between the experience and symptoms does not indicate that the resolution reported by others are invalid whatever psychiatric method is used result in so complex an interpersonal process are likely to be very immensely, not only with the experience of the therapist, but also the billion fold qualities and capacities that vary in each human being. Such qualities undoubtedly play major roles, positive and negative, in the investigation of a pa patient. It is obvious and completely granted facts that some investigators by different or by the same method are able to elicit from the patient material not necessarily available to another. In considering these patients, whether the chief etiologic base, basis for their disorder lies in neurologic defects or in Freudian shaping influences, it is of interest to think of the somatic aspects of our hypothesis. Sherrington's discussions of possible relations between specific neural functions and consciousness, human evaluations, etc., seems pertinent in our problem. Consciousness and more complexly propulsive reactions which accompany it may depend on long circulating circuiting circuiting circuiting, long circuiting of stimulus organism response process. Let me repeat that. Conscious and the more complexly propulsive, these are our intentional reactions which accompany the conscious reaction. 
it may depend on long circuiting of the stimulus organism response process. So he's talking more physiology. Through many millions of neurons in the brain, okay? The variety of response increasing in general with the number of neurons transversed and the specific pathways found. The longer the path in this chain, the more past reactions will be integrated to guide or condition the present performance. The more past sensations or perceptions will be lighted up with awareness or affected or correlated with the present stimulus. And the more the objectively effective and subjectively vivid will be the present response. Rowley, one might say that the most long circuiting is used and the longer and more appropriate the circuits through the millions of neurons that may be available, the more wise in the final scene, the more valuable and less simply mechanical will be the resulting conduct. One might also say that in similar measure, the richer and more emotionally resonant will awareness be. In somatic disorders, one might conceive of a brain in which long circuiting of a sort of of a sort occurs in which the particular vast neuronal pathways which contribute to the most profoundly effective and meaningful components to psychobiologic reactions are not adequately utilized. An interesting and very stimulating attempt to apply Caper's neural box taxis concept to interpretations of psychiatric problems has been made by Igham. If the axiom develops from the positively charged surface and neural activity causes polarizations with the process extending until synapses are formed with axons growing in the direction of the predominating action current and dendrites toward the source, one can indeed conceive neurologically of the development of engrams. Engrams means is a hypothetical change in the neural tissue accounting for persistence of memory. It's a change in the neural tissues accounting for persistence of the memory. He says predominating action current and dendrites toward the source, one can indeed conceive neurologically of the development of these engrams in response to thought, feeling, and conduct, and thereby determined this ingram guy speaks of psychopathic personality as a person in whom the intricate neural patterns of the brain may be so built up that despite a high degree of intelligence and the correlated whole in behavior is defective. The same writer suggests that in the densephalon, the densephalon is spelled D-I-E-N-C-E-P-H-A-L-O-N. This means it is a division of the forebrain consisting of the thalamus, hypothalamus, and the epithalamus, epithalamus, and the sub epithalamus, or the subthalamus. The epithalamus, the subepithalamus, the hypothalamus, and this is the division of the forebrain. This is the deencephalon. All right, so what did he say about this deencephalon? The same writer suggested the deencephalon, which apparently has so much to do with emotional and instinctual reactions, the neuronal patterns may be poorly or defectively developed. The ability to learn practically and to profit by experience so as to promote the success of deep impulses emerging into activity that will not be futile because unadapted to the environment may on this basis be impaired. 
like motivation, right? The ability to learn practically and to profit by experience so as to promote the success of deep impulses like fulfillment in oneself emerging into activity that will not be futile because of unadapted to the environment may on this basis be impaired so he has no motivation due to some type of impairment and it doesn't allow him to have aspirations either so he's kind of wandering around uh, basically Ingram postulates various levels of integration, placing a fourth level in the diacephalum, where sensations may be synthesized into meaning. Synthesizing meanings is integrated into the consciousness as he can formulate or conceive a narrative now of past, a middle, and an end, form a, a full consensus of whatever he's conceiving it has it requires a sensation to be synthesized into meaning so it's a part of the brain that needs to be able to translate whatever that stimuli into a meaning at this level interest may be conceived of as awakening into some form of instinctive behavior animation may arise which calls for action Along such lines, one can conceive of a semantic disorder resulting from the failure of long circuited responses to include or to integrate appropriately these ordinarily long and complicated diacephalin pathways. Perhaps such pathways are deficient because of developmental or hereditary anomalies or as a result of somatic disease or they may fail to be built up properly because of adverse biotactic stimuli, which in turn may have psychogenic explanation. It is perhaps not too fanciful to say that such pathways may be cut off out of the circuit, disassociated or repressed, even though they exist and have been previously used because of a change in biotactic force dependent on psychobiologic functionings in response to conflict, frustrations, or other emotional obstacles like stress. The formulations of Kurtzby, that's another doctor, arose from efforts to apply the methods of engineering and mathematics to the observations of human functioning and malfunctioning. Such of Kurtzby's points are pertinent to the present discussion. Using the terms Schematically and without sharp anatomic or physiologic accuracy, skirts be late, let's thalamus represents the general neurologic background primarily related to emotional response, and cortex represents the similar anatomic background of reasoning, conscious deliberation, etc. Emphasizing that these aspects of behavior or human functionings do not occur in real independent or isolated or, or isolation. The aspects of behaviors or human functionings do not occur in real independent independence or isolation. He speaks of good cortical cortical thalamic integrations to indicate the adequate or normal workings of organisms, such real realizations and evaluations of the situation, effective and satisfying action. In such terms, one can conceive of the psychopath as having poor integration of this sort of stimuli, not passing satisfactorily from the perspective apparatus through sufficient or proper neural circuits in him to experience as others do the major events and the issues of life. Such fundamental differences in the billion fold patterns of synapse facilitations and neural routings might be surmised in relation to the plainly distorted and antiquated inadequate elaborations of his affective experiences and hence of his connative native aims, plans, and performances. 
relatively theological understandings or graspings of events would, according to Kurt Spee formulations, occur if the stimuli from them did not pass through and ritually through the thalamic or the hypothalamic, et cetera, webs of the circuits. These speculations and interpretations seem usefully useful and entirely congruous with what the psychopath shows clinically. Distortions, attituations, short circuitries, and blockages might be surmised on the basis of inborn deficiency. Do y'all hear what I just said? Distortions, attituations, short circuitries, blockages. They all might be surmised on the basis of inborn deficiencies. Inborn deficiencies. Active organic pathology. That's in the environment or as arising through conditioning by experiences similar to what Masterman and others have so vividly demonstrated in animals with experimental neuroses. Strict, strictly Freudian and any other dynamic factors and mechanisms may gradually and pathologically alter or condition functional patterns and circuiting, circuit, circuiting until the organism loses much of its normal responses. And that's the end of section four. This was very rich information to us. See that this could be having some just biochemical sort circuitries. Uh, the inabilities of this weakening of the circuitries due to these inborn conditions. These neural pathologies are inborn. That's what we need to get around to. Proving that these are inborn, they've been passed on, and we're just passing these neural pathologies that are affecting the neural circuitries uh, and the integration into experiences in this person. So they can metabolize empathy in themselves. And this is crazy because this is making them uh, sustained in our environment as psychopaths, unadapted uh, menaces to society. They're distorted, attenuation, sort circuitries, these blockages, they all are affecting these neural pathologies. PTSD, schizophrenia, anxieties, depression, we're all dealing with them. These psychopathologies. We need to take all of this serious. All right. See you guys.